And now for the Xiaomi 12T. The folks at Xiaomi sent over a 12T for me to take on a test drive, share some thoughts, and I think it's a really nice phone. The hardest part of being a tech reviewer is keeping gadgets in the right categories. There are some big claims on this press release for this phone, the camera technology and the performance, and I've been spoiled by the 12S Ultra that I've been carting around. And that's not really fair to the 12T because full MSRP at launch, we're looking at a starting price of around 599 euro or half what my 12S Ultra cost me. The 12T stands as a great transition phone, occupying that space between mid-ranger and premium tier. Now, what if we took some similar hardware to a Poco X4 GT and we spruced it up a little bit and we made it a proper option in the Xiaomi stable? of phones. There are some pros and cons to that kind of launch philosophy, and sometimes the things that make a phone a little more premium aren't always the more practical solutions. Looking at the build quality and the manufacturing, Xiaomi is tactically good at making phones near this price range. The phone is nicely constructed with more curves and tapers. And that's actually one of the first things that I, I've got a nitpick. I would actually prefer flatter sides on our phones, especially since we've got a flat front screen. They're kind of making up the thinness in the feel by tapering the back panel. The screen is gorgeous. The fluid refresh rate, the juicy OLED colors, the deep contrast, nicely readable in direct sun. The haptics are also some of my favorite for that uh, typing feel somewhere in between that little bit of a, a pluck or but with almost some of the woodblock sound that we used to get on older OnePlus phones. But the big hardware change for me, I don't really like it, is we've got this really low mounted in display fingerprint sensor. I mean, this is a good in display sensor. I just think that the power button sensors are demonstrably better. They're faster, they're more consistent. It's the single biggest change that I would like to see on my 12S Ultra is a return to a fingerprint sensor that has a tactile landmark for your thumb. This is another Xiaomi we're gonna add to the list of really solid multimedia phones. We've got great speakers, and, and these are actually some of the best balanced speakers that I can find on a phone. I mean, it seems kind of silly to critique, but on, on a lot of other phones, there might be a slight difference between the earpiece speaker and the bottom firing speaker. But on this phone, we just get vents. We just have these ports on the top and the bottom, and they do seem to feel a little bit more better balanced. <laughs> It feels kind of old fashioned saying this, but I'll always be happy holding on to lifestyle features like an IR blaster. You know, we're losing out on all the other useful bits like headphone jacks and memory card expansion, but I can still control the mismatch of stereo equipment I have on my TV. Software is also really familiar. This is MIUI 13. Immediately, I switched the notification shade back to that single panel. I really hate the side swipes for controls and separating notifications. MIUI is really fun and bouncy. It is, it's I think one of the most colorful options that we have available for Android devices. But I, I'm glad that we've also crested that barrier. A, a lot of times we'd see this kind of heavy customization on a phone, a skin running on top of Android, and that would give us performance concerns. And we just don't see them anymore. There's enough horsepower in our products and we've seen enough software polish that helps optimize for this experience. And it's still, extremely responsive and super fluid. People can fight me in the comments, but I genuinely believe the sleekest and smoothest animations, that award would probably go to MIUI. For how fun MIUI is, I always still just have to, it's a little piece of every Xiaomi video. I always have to highlight some of the concerns that we have for tracking personal information. Like for example, I'm gonna launch my file manager and I get this terms of service where file manager needs to collect necessary personal information to provide you with basic services that generate usage statistics. When we see this popping up on things like calculators, I just feel it's a bit unnecessary, but it obviously resonates with consumers out there. And it is, it's a unique, feel for an Android phone, especially with the chip that's powering the software. Because the performance is excellent 
I, I don't lean on these types of benchmarks. This is the Geekbench score. I can make that a little bit bigger. I mean, those numbers are big and they look goodly. Those are goodly numbers for a powerful phone in this day and age. Uh, what we're rocking here is the MediaTek Dimensity 8100 Ultra. I think in general, this MediaTek is a wonderful sweet spot balance of performance against power draw. In my testing, I'm not entirely sure what makes uh, this an ultra. Why are we calling this an ultra? I can't tell you because a lot of the real world apps and services that I try to test, the numbers seem pretty much identical to the other Dimensity 8100 that I use. That was in the Poco X4 GT and that only has a regular 8100. I, I have to believe it's maybe just a slightly better binned chip or it's a more power efficient chip, but really trying to time the completion of tasks, they seem to be about the same. For truly diehard enthusiasts who pay attention to SOC design, MediaTek has done something clever with this chip. It's a similar core configuration to the venerable Snapdragon 865 from Qualcomm, but it's on a smaller fabrication process and, and it's got a respectably powerful GPU. So this phone isn't going to win many showdowns against uh, some of the newer and more expensive phones like the 8 Plus Gen 1 in my 12S Ultra, but does it really need to? I feel, again, we're still in that section of gross overkill for a lot of consumer needs. We're gonna get performance numbers trailing, but pretty close to the most expensive premium tier phones on a phone that's less expensive and is also going to use less battery and will run cooler, accomplishing similar tasks a little slower. I mean, especially getting into graphics intense gaming. There are a handful of games I like that play better on this style of chip because it won't run as hot. One of my go-tos to torture test is Undead Horde. For really taxing the CPU with all the little animated unit management, the 12T can generally keep up with the 12S Ultra over longer play sessions. Ditto another game like Bright Ridge, where you can specifically dial in graphics settings a lot like a PC. And this phone keeps a high playable frame rate, doing a little better here than the most powerful Qualcomm phones from last year. Those are on Snapdragon 888s. Short story long, all of this to say in the mid-range and premium tiers of phones, it's easy finding a ridiculous amount of compute power, which is grotesque overkill for average consumer daily driver use. It's definitely a win for this phone, for this Xiaomi balancing performance against a bigger battery. And it's a respectably long lived daily driver. I, you know, my Poco M5 is gonna beat it for using a substantially less powerful SOC, but I think under light and moderate use, you know, a little management to power features and the screen refresh, the 12T can easily be a two-day phone. The 12T lacks wireless charging. I, I still get that can be a bummer for some folks. I really don't lean on wireless charging much these days because in the box, I mean, first of all, in the box, not only do we get, you know, uh, the phone, the pre-applied screen protector, a, a respectable little just sort of bumper case, clear bumper case. We also get this beauty right here this monster 120 watt charger. I haven't even peeled off the wrapper on this because I've got a number of other Xiaomi phones with this similar charging brick. I just kind of plugged in and ran with those. Not only included in the price of the phone, in the box that you get the phone with, it's also substantially faster than anything Samsung or Apple might offer as an additional accessory you would need to purchase. Xiaomi's claims might even be a little conservative. From a low battery warning to 100% charge, I got there in just under 20 minutes. There are settings on the phone where you can adaptive charge. You can manage that a bit more if you want, if you wanna plug it in overnight. But really, I like to manage that with hardware. Have a couple of these big bricks ready to go when I need the speed. And then, you know, some other little chargers around where I wanna make sure the phone is charging slower but cooler. And that's gonna bring us to the camera as I pack up this box and move it away. All kinds of glare from my lighting here. All right. I've never been particularly impressed by metrics like the megapixels. Whoa, amazeballs. This has 108 megapixels. That's so many megapixels. I'm gonna get snarky about stuff like that. The reality of using this phone, this camera here is really good for the price tier. Hit the shutter, save a finished HDR JPEG, and it's a 12 megapixel image. Any of these phones with 48 to 50 to 108 megapixel cameras, 
they're all 12 megapixel images. I see very little practical consumer recommended differences in performance when we look at the binned output from like a 48 megapixel shooter to a 108 megapixel shooter, there's really almost no difference. They spit out an HDR juicy, vibrant 12 megapixel image. In general photography critique, that's my current issue right now with the tuning on the 12T. I think it's working a little too hard at maximizing brightness. And we know that this is priming for an eye capturing social media image, but a lot of these images start to fall apart if you dig into them just a little bit more. They're bright, they're juicy, they're fun, they feel a little disposable. I'm making fun of the mega pickles, but but what's always been more critical is the sensor size and the lens quality. This is a solid medium sized sensor, just a tiny hair, a fraction larger than the main sensor in a more expensive Axon 4D Ultra or a Sony Xperia 1 Mark IV. Now, we're talking 0.1 micron larger binned pixels, you know, 0.1 micron measured by my fingers. I guess my fingers would be touching and you'd be measuring the space in between my fingertip ridges. I'm being silly here. This is actually just a tiny hair smaller than some of the sensors found in less expensive phones. But that's also where we see improvements here with lens quality and image stabilization. The video we get is a decent 4K 30 frames per second. I wish we could get 4K 60 for this price, but the quality of the video is very good from the main sensor and we get some great pro modes to play with, raw capture, log video, focus peaking. We lack some of the bells and whistles found on competing products, but the core photography and image experience is good if you can kind of get around some of that HDR JPEG processing. That's from the main sensor. The ultra wide is a little weak. It drops us down to 1080p 30 video. So we get that annoying issue where if you accidentally switch cameras, we used to get this, I, I complained about this on the V60 back in the day. Your, your 4K 30 from the main camera switched to the ultra wide by accident. The ultra wide can only do 1080p 30 and the phone lets you switch sensors. So then it locks you to 1080p 30. So you switch back to the main sensor and you're still in 1080p 30. If the phone can't do 4K 30 and I'm trying to shoot 4K 30, I don't think it should give me the option to switch to the ultra wide, or at least there should be some kind of pop-up on the screen saying, we've reduced the resolution to match this field of view, something like that, just to let the user know when they switch back, this is gonna be a quarter the video quality that they were planning on shooting. But I digress, the ultra wide is small, in great light, it's okay. You can get some nice wide landscapes, but it's not something I'd lean on for much. Since the ultra wide isn't fancy, it means we also have to get this two megapixel macro camera, which you're never gonna use. I know this arrangement has to be saving them money as opposed to using a nicer ultra wide that can also double as a macro shooter, but really, you're just never gonna use it. I kinda wish it just wasn't on the phone at all. Maybe you could save a dollar on the retail price of the phone by not having it. If you pull a two times crop from the main sensor, you won't get quite as close as you can with the macro sensor, but the image is going to be so much better than what you can get with that two megapixel macro. And for a first look, I think that's about where we should start wrapping this video up. The 12T is a great little phone, but it lives in one of the most competitive markets we've ever seen. The amount of phone that you can buy sub 600 euro is astonishing these days. It really matters now that consumers pick and choose the features they really care about. This phone arrives alongside other T-series devices from BBK brands. The latter half of the year refreshes and seeing more of a market for competition where Google can even introduce a little disruption on pricing with the Pixel 6 and Pixel 7. Looking at a Pixel 6a to a Pixel 7, that price window, I think it's one of the reasons why we're getting such aggressive pricing on OnePlus 10T. But not just looking at this and then kind of moving up in price. It's some of the other phones that might be a little bit more expensive than this. I also want to put it in perspective against one of my favorite mid-rangers of the last year. This is the iQ Neo 6. And spec for spec, it's really close to the 12T. Now, almost every individual feature is just a little nicer on the Xiaomi. The cameras are almost identical. The Xiaomi main camera 
is just a little nicer. The screens are very similar. The Xiaomi is just a little brighter. The performance is very close, Snapdragon 865 to Dimensity 8100. I would say the Xiaomi is a little faster at some tasks. The Xiaomi battery is a little bigger and the 12T is a noticeably faster charger, but the fast charging on the Neo is no slouch. Bit for bit for bit, we're comparing specs to specs, but the Neo 6 is a phone that launched around 450 euro for 256 gigs of storage against the starting price of the 12T, which is 599 euro for 128. So there's a 30% price difference. And while the 12T is a better overall phone, you've gotta be really specific about the customer, the consumer who will feel that all of the little improvements really do add up to that 30% price premium. So that's the last little bit for me on this video. I really want to keep these phones in perspective because I've been so spoiled by the big expensive players. But it's also been exciting to see the ridiculous amount of competition we're getting in this middle tier of the market. So the middle is a great place to find high performance phones, but the middle is also getting squeezed really hard from both sides, the more premium side of the market and the more entry level side of the market. If you've ever watched any of my videos, you know how much I like to harp on competition. Competition is the name of the game. We do not get better products if we don't have solid competition and if reviewers are not acknowledging how phones are competing price to performance. 12T occupies this space really well, but it does not exist in a vacuum. All right, folks, I will, of course, leave some links down below for more information on the Xiaomi 12T, where you can shop one of these bad boys online. Also going to highlight, uh, I believe my buddy TK Bay is playing with the bigger brother version of this phone. If you want a little bit more on the 12T Pro, where that might fit into the overall landscape of high performance phones. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos and subscribing to the channel. All of the support lately has been absolutely fantastic. Those of you who are uh, clicking on the links in my descriptions, if you're checking out the home site, somegadgetguy.com, or if you're joining the list of names, scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, that's patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, at some gadget guy on the Twitters and the Twitch, not so much on the Facebooks or the Instagrams, and I will catch you all on the next video.